Here's the brief news from the world over this week. New ethics questions are emerging for Hillary Clinton. An Associated Press investigation revealed that the Global Clinton Initiative had collected more than $300 million from dozens of individuals, private entities, and countries who had met with Clinton during her tenure as Secretary of State. According to an AP review of State Department calendars, at least 85 people from private interests had met or had phone conversations with Clinton while she led the State Department. Combined, those 85 donors gave as much as $156 million to the Clinton Initiative. At least 40 of those who met with Clinton donated more than $100,000 each, and 20 gave more than $1 million. Additionally, Clinton met with representatives from at least 16 foreign governments. They donated as much as $170 million to the Clinton charity. The AP stopped short of saying that they unearthed any clear evidence of a pay-for-play scheme, but questions remain for the presidential candidate. AP reporter Stephen Braun. We've examined, but there's clearly questions about access and clearly, clearly questions about what kind of structures and what kind of rules she, and she would put in place to make sure that, you know, American voters would be satisfied both by the transparency and the limits that she would put into place uh, dealing with ethics. On the campaign trail, Donald Trump, Republican nominee, called the latest revelations about the Clinton initiative a threat to America's foundation of democracy. He said that he's become shocked by the vast scope of Hillary Clinton's criminality, end quote. For her part, Clinton has dismissed the AP report as absurd. She told CNN on Wednesday that the report has all smoke and no fire. Meanwhile, could Donald Trump be softening his stance on immigrants in the United States illegally? During a town hall appearance in Austin, Texas on Tuesday, Trump suggested that he is open to it. When asked by moderator Sean Hannity if he would change the current law to accommodate law-abiding migrants or longtime residents who've raised children in the United States, Trump said, quote, there certainly can be a softening because we're not looking to hurt people. We want people. We have some great people in this country. He added that the laws of the country would be followed. The comments are a sharp departure from his repeated declaration that if elected, he would deport the millions living in the U.S. illegally. Though he did say early in his run for president that deportation policies needed to be done humanely. The Republican nominee said he would come out with a decision about deportations very soon. A planned immigration speech for this week was postponed. More on this and all the latest from the campaign trail in our next segment. And President Barack Obama visited Louisiana for the first-hand look at the damage from the historic floods that have claimed the lives of 13 people and forced thousands from their homes. The president toured some of the hardest hit areas in East Baton Rouge Parish and met with families. He assured them that they are not alone and won't be. The U.S. bishops are calling on all American Catholics to help in the relief effort, asking for a second collection to be taken up to on September 18th. Conference President Archbishop Joseph Kurtz is encouraging the faithful to respond generously. He said our prayer and material support is urgently needed to help rebuild lives. More on this story from Louisiana Senator David Vitter later in the show. And a terrible story coming out of Mississippi. Two Catholic nuns were found in their home dead. A Department of Public Safety spokesman said it appears the nuns were homicide victims. No motive was given, and it wasn't clear if their religious work had anything to do with the slayings. Both sisters were nurse practitioners. Sister Paula Merrill was a sister of charity of Nazareth in Kentucky, and Sister Margaret Held was a member of the School Sisters of St. Francis in Milwaukee. Our thoughts and prayers are with the families of the nuns and their communities. And in central Italy, emergency workers continue their rescue efforts following a 6.2 magnitude earthquake that hit the region early Wednesday morning. So far, more than 250 people are confirmed dead. 
The historic town of Amatrice was at the epicenter of the quake. The town has been devastated, reduced to rubble in many areas. The quake hit in the dead of night. Later that morning, at his general audience, Pope Francis led the faithful in a rosary for the quake victims, assuring all of his prayers. The quake struck near Norcia, the birthplace of St. Benedict, and the home of the Benedictine monks of Norcia. For more, I'm joined from Rome by the prior of the Monastery of St. Benedict, Father Cassian Folsom. Father Cash, and thank you for being with us. Give me a sense of the state of your monastery, the basilica there in Norcia, the birthplace of St. Benedict, and the town surrounding it. Well, uh, the earthquake, thanks be to God, didn't take the lives of any of the people in town, and the monks are safe and sound, and that's the most important thing. But extensive damage has been done uh, both to the monastery and to the basilica. We're guessing that the basilica will be closed for a year, uh, the monastery, we're still waiting. We, we can't, um, we can't uh, stay in the monastery, so we had to take refuge uh, at the Benedictine University in Rome uh, because uh, there's, there's danger of, uh, uh, well, it's dangerous to be in the monastery. So we're waiting for official inspection uh, to determine what is structural damage and what is simply superficial damage. You do have a monk staying there, though, uh, as an act of solidarity with the people, as well as to, I imagine, keep an eye on the, on the monastery, correct? Well, we have two monks staying up there, but they're sleeping in tents outside. It's precisely to, um, to be with the townspeople and to keep an eye on the place, just as you said. The, but the structure is very weakened. I know you have been doing extensive renovations, and we're seeing video of uh, the basilica as it was. You'd been uh, renovating the side chapels and, and other parts of the monastery. Is all of that ruined, Father? Uh, no. The, um, the trouble is we can't do an accurate uh, uh, survey of those things uh, because we can't uh, stay in the building. So we have to wait for it. See, there have been tremors, and, and it's not just been one earthquake, but several, uh, and continuous tremors. Uh, and we're hoping that uh, by tomorrow things will calm down enough so that we can do an, an actual, a careful analysis of, of the damage that has been done. An example, however, in the refectory of the monastery, where uh, some beautiful paintings have been, have been done, uh, there's various parts that have chipped off, but it, there's no structural damage there. In the basilica, uh, the, the altar of St. Benedict, uh, the, the stone behind the altar uh, pushed through and, uh, and uh, hurtled to the ground, uh, along with all kinds of stucco, and uh, that's, uh, that will need extensive repair. The side altars that we've been repairing, um, we're not, it seems that the side altars themselves are okay, but the structures around it are um, sagging. We're not quite sure how it's all going to turn out. Father, how are you and the community doing emotionally? I know interviewing survivors of the Louisiana floods, having gone through Katrina myself, it does take an emotional toll on you. Well, some, some of the monks have been a little bit traumatized by it. Um, their, their first experience of, a, of an earthquake, and it takes a lot of emotional energy, certainly. Um, but, of course, we are fortified by faith, and uh, we know that it, we're, we're in God's hands, and it's uh, His providence, and things will, things will work out the way they're supposed to. Uh, the main thing, and I'm extremely grateful, is that all the monks are safe. Well, we are certainly grateful for that as well. And uh, Father Cash and Folsom, we will put up uh, an email address where people can help. Know that our prayers are with you and the friars and all those in Orsha and the surrounding areas in central Italy. It's a horrible thing to behold. Uh, I did have an email. I've got to ask you this. Uh, some of your fans, those who drink your beer, uh, the uh, beer inertia, they, they are asking, what's the state of the brewery? Well, thanks be to God, it's intact. The, the, the um, fermenters did move a bit. Uh, in the earthquake, and that's a good thing because if they had stayed, they're not fixed to the floor. And if they had been fixed, they could have uh, burst. But as it is, that's intact, uh, and we're waiting to, to go back and make sure that all the pipes are uh, in good order. 
but it seems that uh, that the brewery is is uh, hasn't suffered any damage. Good, Father Cashin. Thank you so much for being with us. Godspeed, and we'll check in with you in the days ahead. You can help the Benedictine monks of Norcia in their recovery efforts by visiting their website at nursia, N-U-R-S-I-A dot org. And the monks remain the best-selling classical artists of the year. Their latest CD, Benedicta, Marian Chant from Norcia, is also available at their website at nursia.com, at Amazon, and at the EWTN Religious Catalog. The music and their Bira Nursia beer are the monks' sole sources of income, so do support them if you can. And the European Union's counterterrorism agency has intercepted fake passports destined for alleged ISIS members hidden among the Middle Eastern refugees in Greece. The Italian daily La Stampa is reporting that officials from Europol investigated the trafficking of fake documents from Iraq and Syria into Greece and Austria. Many of the fake passports were destined for refugee camps in Greece. The report comes amid renewed concerns over the wave of new migrants into Greece this week. Some 58,000 migrants have landed in Greece since February. Meanwhile, France is fighting against the Islamicization of its country as a growing number of resort towns are banning the so-called burkini swimsuit. Political leaders there are arguing that the body-covering swimwear resembling a full-length, loose-fitting wetsuit with a hood oppresses women and that it violates France's secular principles. On French television, Prime Minister Manuel Valls said the burkini is a symbol of women enslavement. It's a vision of women that we have to fight against, end quote. The new law is being enforced. In Nice, police were seen instructing a Muslim woman to remove her burkini. The creator of the burkini says all of the controversy has spiked her sales. And a major abortion provider in England has temporarily suspended some of its operations following surprise inspections that uncovered safety concerns. Marie Stopes International announced that it would stop performing abortions across the UK on minors and other vulnerable groups of women. The Care Quality Commission in Britain found problems with consent as well as unsafe conditions in the clinics. Marie Stopes International performs over 70,000 abortions a year in the UK. And a recent Pew Research survey of religious faith in America has uncovered some surprising data. Pew says the number of Americans claiming no religion, the nons, has increased from 16% to nearly 25% in just under a decade. Almost 80% of the adults who identify with no religion say they abandoned the faith of their childhood once they came of age. At the same time, the study found that 51% of Americans now attend church regularly. 49% hardly attend at all. And a federal judge in Texas has temporarily blocked the Obama administration's directive requiring school districts to allow transgender students to use restrooms corresponding to their chosen gender identity. In his ruling, District Judge Reed O'Connor indicated that federal agencies overstepped their authority under a 1972 law banning sex discrimination in schools. The injunction applies nationwide and is at least the third legal setback to the Obama administration's transgender directive for public schools. The Justice Department lamented the decision and is currently reviewing its options in response. You've heard me here talk about my Will Wilder series and a certain stolen relic that inspired it. Sadly, this next story is not fiction. In San Francisco, a relic believed to be a fragment of the true cross of Christ was snatched this week. The relic seen here at the very center of the photo was taken from its locked reliquary at St. Dominic Church. The church has no security cameras and there were no witnesses to the theft. Church pastor Father Michael Hurley told Catholic News Agency that the relic is very much part of the devotional life of the parish and said he was hopeful that the thief would come to understand 
how much the relic means to the faithful there and return it. I told you this stuff happens. And with the school year beginning, I'm giving away some brand new audio books. They were just released, and I'll announce the contest on next week's show. But if you sign up for my free e-blast at RaymondArroyo.com, you'll get the first notice of the contest. So sign up for the e-blast and stay tuned for your chance to win some incredible audio books for the whole family.